Hey guys, this is Echo Soundworks and you are checking out a tip and trick tutorial video on ADSR. So in this video, I am finally getting around to answering without a doubt the most common question I get on all of the tutorial videos I do on YouTube. And that is, what is this mastering chain over here on my master bus, my two bus? And why do I use it? So I get this question on almost every video I do. I get emails, I get Facebook uh, messages about this. And I wanted to discuss why it's there, how I use it, and what's going on with it, and how you can recreate something similar for yourself. So first to do that, let's just dive right in. I'm going to turn these different plugins off, and we are going to listen to this track. And then we're going to A, B it with them on. So let's just do that now. All right, guys, so there is the A-B comparison. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about this. This is something that I don't want to get off on a tangent with. I know a lot of people are taught not to ever mix into a limiter or mix into a compressor, but that's just flat out not something that has to be. I don't know why it's this industry standard. I have a theory as to why. But long story short, I, I interned at a, at a fairly high-profile studio in Hollywood when I was in college and the engineer was a or is a Grammy winning platinum producing engineer and he makes a couple of plugins on his Pro Tools uh, master master track and I asked him why he did it and basically was just like well I used to do this on large format consoles and so it's there are a lot of engineers well a good amount now that actually do this type of thing and if you Google this, a lot of articles will come up being like, never, ever mix into a limiter or a compressor. And I don't know why that's the thing. You have to know how to do it. But if you do it and you do it well, you're going to get a really good, nice, loud sounding mix without having to go to a mastering engineer. And that brings up my other point. I think mastering engineers, obviously how they get paid is by using limiting and compression on your overall track. So of course, any article written by any type of mastering engineer is gonna say, don't do this. Well, here's why I do it. First, if I work with a client, whether it's a vocalist, a rapper, whatever, or I have to, I have to get something done in 24 hours for TV and film, I don't have time to send out to a mastering engineer. My clients don't care if I'm like, well, it'll be a little bit louder once we send it to mastering. A rapper doesn't care if supposedly the mastering engineer is going to make it more magical and loud and knock harder, right? If I send something to a client, whether it's an artist or someone in the sync TV world, I want them to hear something that is commercially competitive right off the bat, right? First impressions are huge. If I obviously want to throw something up on SoundCloud, and I don't want to actually like release the track and do album art, crazy album artwork and videos and that sort of stuff. I just want to kind of get a, something out there. I'll typically just do this, right? Now, that's why I think that if you get good at this, it helps because you're sending out higher quality mixes at an earlier stage in the process. I will, though, get my music mastered once I want to commercially release something. But what I'll do is I'll send the mix with everything on it that I'm really happy with to the mastering engineer and I'll say, hey, do you think you can do better than this? If you can, if you can do like a money guarantee for this, I'll, I'll work with you. And I've since established a few relationships with mastering engineers for various genres. But if they can't make it better, cleaner, bigger, and louder than what I did, why am I paying them for it, right? Because I'm not a mastering engineer by trade, obviously. So what I'll do is I'll send them two versions of the mix, the version with the plugins on the master bus, and then a second version which is to their specs, right? With however much headroom they want. So that being said, that's why I do this. I know some of you are going to be very like, oh no, you shouldn't do this. Well, that if, if that works for you, that's fine. But that is some 
I think that's information that has just been regurgitated so many times, it's not even thought about why it's regurgitated anymore. So let's go through these different plugins. First plugin that I'll, you'll see on this chain here is called the Vintage Aural Exciter or the Apex Vintage Exciter by Waves. Now an exciter does exactly what it says it's doing. It's gonna excite certain frequencies of the mix. Now I'm a pretty simple uh, engineer when it comes to mixing on a track level. If I go through some of my different tracks here, just arrow through them, you'll notice that a lot of them don't have any additive EQ, right? I'm just cutting EQ frequencies like low passes and high passes. I'm not actually adding frequencies to a lot of my tracks. And because of that, my mixes can sound a little, I don't want to say lifeless, but they don't, they don't have a lot of high end to them. So what I do is I use a little bit of exciter or excitement to kind of bring that back in. Now, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just use this to check my mix. I'll play it with the vintage exciter on, and then I'll be like, oh, it sounds good. And then I'll turn it off and I'll be like, oh, it sounds bad. And then I'll go back to individual tracks and throw on some EQ that is like an analog emulation to add some more high-end frequencies. But let's turn off all the other components here and let's just play this. Let's turn it off. Let's turn the exciter off now. Right, so it's not adding a whole lot. I have it set to one, 1 1.03. If we turn it all the way up, my voice is gonna get real weird. Right, so that sounds awful, obviously, but having it around one to two can do some really cool things to a mix. Now, a huge, huge element of setting up your mastering chain is making sure that you do not clip in between individual plugins. And it's very important that you don't clip just coming into your chain. So if I play my track, right, I'm peaking at about negative 3.4, so I'm not clipping. The Aphex Vintage Exciter, I've actually turned the input down by about a decibel, and I've turned the output down by 0.3. So I'm actually probably gonna lose volume on my mix right now. Yeah, I have. I've lost like 0.3 of a decibel. But what that what that maintains is I'm not clipping in between individual plugins, which is nice. So the next plugin that I'll go into after the exciter is going to be some sort of console emulation, like a channel console emulation. Waves, SSLG channel. I like using the Slate virtual mix rack. And inside of the mix rack, I'll use Revival and the virtual mix bus. Revival is a sonic enhancement circuit. So it can add air and thickness. So again, I'm setting things quite low here. I'm being conservative with how I'm setting my different elements of this master chain. I've set both of them to about eight and they go up to 40. Now the next plugin here is the virtual mix bus. And this is emulating a console bus. So I'm setting it to the British 4KE and again, I've put the input down by about a decibel, 1.3 decibels, and the output down by about a half a decibel or a little bit more. So again, I'm actually probably losing volume overall on my mix right now. Let's check this out. So is that negative 2.6? Let's play it without these. So negative 2.1 right there at the end. And I stopped about the same place. So I'm not gaining much volume to my track yet or my overall mix, and that's fine. I'm using this just to color the sound to make it have that it factor. Now the next plugin that I'll go into is the API 2500. And this is the one you always see first on my YouTube videos. And this is a tweak of a preset here that I used uh, that I've changed over time. It's called the, Le, I don't know how to say that name, Lave, Levine, Le, Lave, Levine, is that Levine? <laughs> Modern Mastering Glue, preset 29 if you guys have this. And this is the Waves API 2500 compressor. And I've changed the initial preset a little bit, but that's that was my starting point. So I'm going to run through all the individual controls. I have analog on to give it that analog air sound that the Waves plugins have. Then I set the output to about 1.4, so I'm actually adding volume. Now I had about three decibels of headroom before I turned any of these plugins on on, on my uh, master track here, my master bus, my two bus. So adding another decibel of gain, I'm still not going to be clipping. Now 
you have to be aware of how much headroom you have before you set your output. Don't just set it willy-nilly. Now, the next thing I'm going to go over here is the compressor settings itself. I have the threshold at about 8. I keep the threshold quite low. I have the attack at a very low setting, the lowest it goes. The ratio, the lowest it goes. And the release is in the middle. So it's not compressing to the 9s here. Right, so now I'm peaking at negative 1.2 decibels, which is fine. I still have headroom to play. So that is what I'll run into there. Again, adding just a little bit of volume to it. And all three of these plugins here that we've used, the Vintage Exciter, the Virtual Mix Rack, and the Waves API, they're all uh, analog emulations. So they add some type of less of a sterile environment to the sonic palette of the mix. Now next, I turn on the sausage fattener and i love this plugin you guys if you guys watch my videos you know i use it all the time but i again i'm setting things very conservatively i'm not turning this up to like 40 percent or whatever i usually set in between five and ten percent so this was set at eight percent for this mix and uh so this is going to add a little bit of overall volume to my mix but my gain here is set to zero so let's check this out All right, so it's added about a decibel of gain just by giving it 8% on the fatness. I, I don't typically color it either. So that's all that's going on with the sausage fattener. Now, the last thing that I use in my mastering chain is the FabFilter Pro limiter. And this one is, if you guys aren't a, if you guys aren't used to using limiters, this is without doubt my favorite one. It's very clean sounding. It's very easy to get the hang of, but here are the controls and here are how I set things. First things first, go set your output down below zero. So you don't want it at unity because things, if your mix is peaking right at unity, it's probably going to clip on like earbuds and laptop speakers. So I turn it down to about negative 0.2, negative 0.3. We'll do negative 0.3 right now. So I'm safeguarding from clipping on smaller listening mediums. The gain, my input gain here is set anywhere, anywhere between positive 1.5 and 3. So I'm kind of in the middle of this. It's at 2.5 decibels. Now, style, I like, you can use any style that makes sense to you if you're using this exact same plugin. I will typically use all around or transparent. The look ahead, I have quite low. The attack, I have at about 250 milliseconds. The release, about 500 milliseconds. And I'll change this if my track is slower or faster, depending. And then really all I do is mess around with the output a little bit. And sometimes I'll turn the oversampling on when I'm actually bouncing it out and then sending to a client, but that's really it. So the uh, look look ahead, if you don't know what that is in the limiter, it is a, uh, it's gonna tell the FabFilter Pro L how quickly to respond to sudden peaks in the audio. With shorter look ahead times, you can achieve greater loudness at the cost of possible distortion. So if your kick is really loud or some really tra uh, transient heavy sound in your mix is making things distort, you might wanna turn the look ahead up. Now the attack, with limiters, typically the shorter attack times are safer, longer attack times are louder because they're going to let through more of the more of the transients, right? So I have mine set kind of under the in the middle, slightly under the middle, I guess. So these aren't extreme settings by any means, but when we put this all together, I've added about three decibels of gain. Uh, clinically to my mix, but if we look at what's going on on an RMS le level or a LUFS level, which is a more accurate way of perceiving volume, I've probably added more than that. So let's turn all these off real quick and play it and pay attention to the LUFS and the RMS. All right, so it's about negative 14.4 on the RMS, about negative 16 and a half on the LUFS. Let's turn all these on and listen one more time. All right, so my RMS value was at about negative eight, which is quite loud. Really, really loud tracks would be about negative three, negative four, like Skrillex type loud. Um, 
it, yeah, so if you're anywhere between like negative five and negative 10 RMS, you're going to have a pretty loud track. And that's pre vocals. If there's vocals on this or anything, which I mixed it to have vocals, obviously, um, at some point, it's going to, the RMS value is going to go up. So it adds a lot of perceived loudness. So there you guys go. There is my master chain that I use on a lot of different tracks, and you should be able to set up your own now using either plugins like these or these exact ones or ones like these. If you guys have any questions or comments, let me know below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I'm Echo Sowers. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.